Hello, welcome. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rail 711th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Yunfei Ji and Lily Wei. We are thrilled to welcome poet Ruja Mohasesi here to close today's program. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. And here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Yanfei Ji, born in Beijing, China, util utilizes the symbols of folkloric tradition to speak truth to power. Full of phantoms, demons, and other spectral characters, Ji's paintings have frequently functioned as metaphorical critiques of oppressive power structures and strategies of, of defiance. In his ink and watercolor compositions, these ghostly figures are stand-ins for the complex political undercurrents and cultural tug of war shaping rural communities in a rapidly developing world. New York-based independent curator, writer, journalist, critic, and rail contributor Lily Wei writes on global contemporary art and emerging art and artists. She has written for dozens of publications as the author of numerous catalogs and monographs, and she sits on the board of several nonprofit art institutions and organizations. Thank you all so much for being here today, and I'll turn it over to you, Lily. Okay, thank you so much, Carolyn, and um, thank you, uh, and welcome to everyone who's joined us. Um, I thought we would be again at looking at some of the images. Um, I think the first images will be of uh, Yungfei uh, current show at Jim Cohen, which will be up through um, January 7th, is that right? January 7th. And of course, I don't need to tell everyone here that while it will be wonderful to look at these images today and talk about them with Yungfei, um, it does not, um, it, it does not substitute for actually seeing the work in person. So I urge you all to go and look at the show. It's 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 quite wonderful. And uh and after we look at these few installation shots, we shall um briefly talk about some of uh Yungfei's beginnings. We'll look at some earlier works briefly and then we will go into this current show to uh discuss what has remained, what has changed, um and what um and, and and like that. So, okay, th this is some early work. It's from 2006. Uh, Yungfei, do you have any comments? These are sort of, these are the works that seem much more traditionally oriented. I mean, this is like a Sun painting in many ways. Mm -hmm. And of course you are known for that, you know, for using a, a classical Chinese vocabulary, visual vocabulary and discussing contemporary uh, pressing, contemporary issues um, using that vocabulary. Right, thank you, Lily. Um, and thank you, Caroline. And thank you, um, Brooklyn Rail for inviting me to do this talk today. And uh, um, um, I have been, uh, this first image um, is some, is related to Song Dynasty painting uh, monumental landscape tradition, um, uh, where um, there's a sort of a, a coded language uh, that was I was very interested in, um, like the high mountain peaks uh, is a sort of a stand-in for the authority, the power of the state. Um, so um, even though it's you're looking at the landscape, it's actually uh, uh, there's a, a whole uh, a way of reading the landscape. And for me, as a maker of the work, I'm very interested in this tradition of um, you know uh, this long tradition of 
of resistance, of critique, and of uh, satire in classical Chinese landscape painting of power of, um, um, you know, uh, that operates and that uh, is sort of through its policy, it's invisible. There is a, the, the force, you know, the, um, the sort of awe-inspiring kind of uh, fearful kind of uh, a situation. And this also, uh, the title for this piece is uh, below the 143 meter watermark is part of my uh, very large um, project of um, related to work to uh, the Three Gorges Dam uh, in 2002. Like it's being kind of scheduled and it's being kind of uh, prepared for so many years. Uh, and uh, in 2002, there really in the middle of building this and I went to see it, uh, the process. And I, I, that's a part of my practice very much. It's like, I like to take myself out of my studio and always try to put myself in the middle of all these things that's happening and try to learn from it. Um, so, um, like- you know, I, know, I just wanted to say, you've always done a kind of immersive research. Did that- begin with, I mean, could you talk a little bit about your bi biography that made you want to do that kind of thing? Yeah, uh, I think it have to do with my um, distrust of power. Like when I was uh, young, um, you know, I, um, I grew up, you know, partially in the countryside with my grandmother, partially in the army base where there was a lot of um, like uh, disgraced high level army official. And, uh, you know, so, I would call them uncle and things. Uh, and then I, when I go to the museum, because they're disgraced, their portrait has been removed. That used to be in some black and white photograph of the, say the, the war with Japan and things like that. And uh, so they were, portrait were removed. And also some of my teachers were history painters and they were, you know, there were so many purges during the Cultural Revolution where I grew up that they were, you know, you constantly, you constantly go back to the National Museum to remove some figures who were used to standing right next to Chairman Mao and things like that. And so I had this uh, I, a distrust of, uh, of this official representation mm -hmm. of, you know, and um, uh, so, when I come out to, I was 21 when I come to United States and uh, I was uh, really interested in reading about history. How like, because in his, the history was written in such a way was really very distorted. Um, so I was, even though my English was still very poor at that time, I was reading, you know, like, like Jonathan Spence, like uh, mm -hmm. the search for modern China, books like that. I, uh, describing what's happened. And I was, you know, at least provides me with another uh, perspective, um, you know, uh, what's, what, what's happened. So I did, you know, uh, when I first showed my work, it was have to do with opium war, with like the Boxer Rebellion. And I was uh, drawing a lot of my inspiration from history, you know. Uh, and then the Three Gorges Dam came after that. And I feel like this history is happening now. I needed to go to find out firsthand. So there's a very much, um, when I was showing my work in China, like say 10 years ago, there were a lot of interest from investigative journalists. They feel like someone, they feel very, some kind of kinship or, you know, so I had, um, like a lot of interesting conversations with, with, you know, people who are ordinarily are not interested in art, you know, and um, things like that. Well, it's always interesting, too, that you said that you got a different point of view on what you were actually living through um, mm -hmm. from uh, Western artists like, well, well, like Jonathan Spence, but even before that, I mean, way before that, you know, Snow and, and all of those people who were yeah. you know, from a certainly different perspective. So mm -hmm. I thought that, you know, um, that that's kind of unsettling right and mm -hmm. um 
And I would think that those experiences were the kind that um, sort of stimulated the, the subjects you've chosen, the point of view you've chosen when you've done your works. It, yeah. And also it was, uh, you know, during the Cultural Revolution was very ideologically extreme. Yeah. And uh, there were anything that related to the old traditional painting, it was forbidden or it was seen as uh, like, like a garbage, like, you know, so we, we were, our generation in a way was very displaced from the ancient tradition. And so it was kind of a rediscovery through as I was going to art school and I was actually studying oil painting. And then I went to Dunhuang and uh, some of these Buddhist sites and just really blown away by what I saw. And, uh, um, and that's the start of my journey of uh, exploring like how, you know, there were many, many oppressive regimes in China throughout the 4,000 year history and how artists were dealing with it. And they were able to use their sense of humor and survive and to, you know, kind of uh, develop the vocabulary of resistance. So I kind of, uh, in a way, kind of, when I was making this body work, like for example, like this one we're looking at is, is people losing gravity. And it was like a wind blowing. And, and the wind was historically, was very much like metaphor for the state power, you know, very much like the emperor's influence. Uh, so, uh, so other than the mountain um, as a sort of representation of a standing in for power, in this case was the wind that was standing for power, you know, and uh, and that is uh, very much rooted in uh, classical Chinese poetry. Like, you know, a lot of um, great poets that I admire that they. They were using it in such a powerful way. It's like uh, 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 amazing. Like uh, maybe that helped me to kind of aspire to, to be, um, you know, to make work that as powerful. Or, you know, that's my ultimate like ambition. You know. So here's a, a, just a, you know a question here about. Um, the the style you chose, I mean, to use traditional, very as I said, you know, like Song Dynasty to begin with, and and I mean, one reason, of course, uh, the question is why did you actually choose that particular style? I mean, I know you were trained at Kafa at the Central mm -hmm. Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing in China, and then when you came here, you got your MFA at um, at the University of Arkansas, right? So, but anyway, but but just going back to um, this you know, this kind of traditional language mm -hmm. um, was, and I'm just trying to get the, um, the mm -hmm. chronology of this because, you know, what is what is considered uh, resistance or uh, avant-garde at a certain point is not at another point. So you take what is a very traditional vocabulary and at the time you chose it, was it a questionable thing to do? Politically, as well as perhaps aesthetically, uh, I think it's a it's a, um, like I said, uh, you know, there were as I was growing up, it was such a sort of a forbidden thing, right? And, but at the same time, when I come to the West, I feel like um, there is something missing. Like I feel that what is I wanted to challenge what contemporary art is, and uh, what people's maybe a misreading of uh, uh, of this kind of work, um, I wanted to undermining and the expectation and I wanted to putting many other things in there that was, I wanted to surprise, you know, to, uh, to make uh, some kind of subversion of, of, ex of the expectation of what that could be, you know, and, and also challenge the notion of what contemporary art could be. Um, yeah. <laughs> So this idea of subversion, I think, has been a uh, characteristic of, of you, of yeah. your, of your uh, you know, point of view. Yeah, yeah. I think it's even like when I make work that was uh, more recent work. I'm also, I think it's a the language of art always carries because it's history that carries association and misreading as well. You know, mm -hmm. so when you have that, is something artists can do to subvert, you know, to kind of uh, break 
away from or challenge that expectation, you know. Well, you, you've talked about the subtleness of uh, critique in, in Chinese art, among Chinese artists. And I think it, you know, continues to this day. Um, mm -hmm. And because it's very difficult at times to be as open as one might you know, be in, 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 a, in, a more, in more democratic societies. Yeah, yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. would I you- I mean, the, the situation right now is very um, depressing, really. Like even, you know, lawyers get put in prison or silenced and, you know, that the, the, the ordinary people's rights are very much trampled, I feel like, especially, you know, the weakest, members of society and, and you know rural areas as well i feel yeah a very big problem and, and also civil society and and the art and all these things are being uh watched very carefully and very very strict censorship so yeah the, it's like my myself was uh, in, involved uh with uh the shanghai biennial on uh, back a few years ago, and uh, my work was censored, so they were trying to cover part of it and things like that. So, yeah, it's uh, it's very real in China, like in terms of, you know. Yeah, I I watched them at uh, at a Shenzhen Biennial, mm -hmm. paint over immediately after it, it was evident what it was. Paint over that blue a blue chair that would have been the Os the Oslo um, mm -hmm. Peace Prize for for the writer, you know. Which whose name just suddenly escaped me, oh. but you know what I mean. And mm -hmm. they just took the 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 the, the painter, the artist, and his wife, his collaborator, who is French, and they just put them on a plane and got them yeah. out. Of there. Yeah, and, you know, just like that, they were gone. You know, but yeah. that was pretty. Um, you know, I was uh, you know received a phone call in the like two in the morning because mm -hmm. the censor had walked through the show that like the museum. I had to give all the images writings to the museum and they were supportive and they were great. But the censor, it was a group of people walking through the show like two in the morning. And I was told that I needed to, you know, kind of, they're going to do this to my work. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you know, it, it's also the, 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 the notion that at one point, I don't think official dumb or you know, we're looking that closely at art. They found it visual art they found it relatively harmless versus yeah. you know the written word which everyone thought yeah you had That's to be absolutely. really really careful but you could put things in paintings and in sculptures and works of art that nobody was paying that much attention to but i think that's changed what what do you think i think yeah, yeah. much I, more it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's uh i thought it was, at that time that was before xi jinping becomes the yeah. president and the uh, uh, I thought Shanghai would be project this image of uh, more cosmopolitan, more tolerant. And, and yet I find at that time, about 10 years ago, Shanghai was much worse than Beijing, you know, in terms of, um, you know, it's much more strict, uh, more controlled by the propaganda department, you know. Unbelievably, that is still an official name for these people, <laughs> you know. Um, so, um, but still I was able to make a show in Shanghai. I was able to make a show in Beijing and uh, at the UCCA. And um, I was able to, I did uh, so many uh, interviews and talking with people of a different, uh, you know, uh, from different walks of life, from different kind of journalists and investigative journalists. Uh, news like it's just uh i was kind of um, really surprised at the level of interest and i think it's uh, the idea of uh, you know the the work that touches on the sort of climate change and and uh, you know pollution uh, very much was on the mind of everyone there and uh, and also they were they see the the effort was very serious so the people were um you know, interested in um, when I was there. So, and, and the themes that you have that have always engaged you. I mean, they're they're still present. I mean, they've been there 
you know, almost from the beginning. Would you say that? Would that be? Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the, like I said, this uh, idea of uh, in relation to history, to what's happening, that has been a long-term interest. And also, I like to put myself in, in this different happenings and different, you know, the life. Um, it, that's also been many years. Uh, and also, I think, you know, I wanted to, the current show is have to do with the, uh, I wanted to make visible, like the labor of people, like laboring, like uh, factories and in China and what's happening in rural China. Like um, I shifted to from works on paper to canvas um, to maybe bring it closer to my American audience, but uh, very much still like I'm very interested in the idea of working like push back at the idea of erasure, you know, like, you know, the Chinese American uh, experience of this um, you know, building of the railway, uh, uh, Chinese labor had made such a contribution to building the railway in the West Coast, the, the transatlantic, um, the railway. And yet when they take the final photograph, they were all no, no Chinese labor was present. They were completely deleted from the history, you know? Yeah, um, I remember that photograph and I was kind of shocked it's when so, I heard it's that. So, yeah. It's so poignant. I was just like, unbelievable. It was, you know, and it was such a dangerous work and they were, um, they really worked hard to try to, you know, is, and then it was in the history book, they were just disappeared, you know? And the same thing happened with the, uh, June, June 4th, um, I, I'm of the generation uh, who, um, you know, was a part of my life, you know, I was here, but I was, you know, part of the protest and, uh, and, and in China now they are, they did a good job of erasing that whole event from the memory of the people and the, to the extent that young people don't even know what that was, you know. Um, so, um, well, they'll have to read it outside, like you did, you know, from yeah. outside sources, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, also the Great Leap Forward. Uh, I did a show in Belgium actually focused on the Great Leap Forward to, to kind of at that time, the Great Leap Forward was totally forbidden to talk about because there were almost everyone I know knows someone sort of starved and things. So, uh, and because of policy, um, it, it was totally like disappeared in history. Like, oh, that was just natural cause and thing. But it was completely because of policy of uh, governmental policy, you know, it causes, you know, 300 million people or so are dying from hunger in the middle of 20th century, you know, like 58, 50, nine and 60 right before I was born. And I think there were, so as a artist kind of uh, grew up the way I did, I, I feel very strongly about try to uh, work against this kind of uh, erasure, you know, kind of someone in power is trying to hide these things. And <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it seems like it's almost impossible to hide, and yet it's done. You know, it's all it's done it's all the time. Unbelievable! Yeah, it's unbelievable how something so important uh, uh, and uh, all of a sudden the young people just have never heard of. It. I, I just couldn't believe it. Well, these are your themes, though. I mean, like migration, displacement. I think you know, great movements of populations, societies in transition, in in cataclysmic transition. I mean, would would you say that? I mean, they seem to yeah. be there throughout your work. Yeah, this this show, um, by the way, is is sort of my. I did this work during the pandemic, and it's mm, small, and they're. Um, you know, like this work is right now. We're looking at this painting. Is um, kind of uh, I visited this factory in China, and I when I was come to New York in the early '90s, 
I have a friend working in the garment industry and in, a, in, in the garment district and sewing clothes or designing patterns. And so I have, I know a little bit about this whole making of a clothes. So, and um, I wanted to, yeah. So this is a small painting of um, two people sewing clothes. You know, I did another one of a sewing unit, you know, of, you know like five, six women sewing clothes and, This this actually looks rather uh, idyllic, you know. I mean, it doesn't yeah. look like it doesn't look like a, a sweatshop because you have the win the open windows. Um, yeah. And but is right. that is that your intention or is it just? Well, like, I'm yes. Just um, um, I don't want it to. Yeah. Um, you know the the like I said, I want to make visible the workings of the Chinese people. Uh, ordinary people and uh, and also the joys of labor. I mean, uh, not joys of labor, but they're like in color, when I was using the color, I wanted to have paint the joys of painting and the, and light. Uh, you know, it's a very mundane scene, scene but the light gave it uh, a kind of uh, buoyancy, you know? And, uh, and I'm looking for that kind of balance of the color as, something buoyant and yet the scene is very almost drab and very maintained. Uh, I feel like there's a tension I was looking for, you know? Well, just speaking of color, I, I, I thought we should discuss, you know, at some point around here, but let's do it now um, about this kind of stylistic change as well. For example, um, in your earlier work, I think you rely a great deal uh, on, on line mm. and by the way, as we all know, just looking at uh, knowing Jung Fei's work, he's an incredible draftsman. I mean, he is a prodigiously talented draftsman. And I, I, had, I would assume that one reason you did do a, a kind of classical, you know, ch Chinese um, uh, vocabulary uh, that you used it is because you could. You know? <laughs> I don't know that everybody could do do it that way. I well. had to. I had to learn, and I had to. I mean, even like the mounting, and there's so many pretty difficult things, and and uh, and learn it, you know. <laughs> I know, but it's extraordinary. <laughs> but then, on the other hand, like with this and with these works, I mean, while color did appear in your earlier works, and certainly as, as we were watching the sequence of it, um, you were using more color uh, than I'd seen, I, if I remember correctly, in the in the 2016, 18 works um, here. It seems like everything is constructed out of color more than yeah. line. Yes, um, yeah. Could you that's discuss really, that a little? That's a really a bit of a observation because I think work the, on paper you have more the room of um, to suggest uh, certain things, and in color, you uh, it's a, it's a different language. So um, when I'm working here, like light is very important and uh, um, yeah, so the intensity of color versus the color that's um, more muted and you know, all the contrast of that. And yeah, so that's all, uh, for me, it's a, it's a new, uh, like I'm, I'm during this pandemic, I'm just like really, in a way, kind of, uh, it's a re really a, a good challenge for me, you know, to kind of embrace this, um, the new, the new process and material. Um, and I mean, I love painting of all kinds, you know, and uh, so uh, definitely. Um, yeah, but it's looser, right? And it's, yeah. it feels more almost, uh, well, a la prima, more improvisational. Mm -hmm. um, uh, did you find that? I mean, when that, yeah. that you were, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. I and, was, uh, yeah, just a, a very, I'm looking for some kind of something very loose and spontaneous at the same time, um, the very deliberate, you know, like certain areas want to be articulated in the right way, you know, so. In, in the right way? 
Uh, <laughs> that's me. <very, laughs> Just that's wondering. Very, <laughs> yeah, very subjective, of course. You know. um, well, it's also the way the space is. I mean, in, in your other works, um, a, a lot of space is just kind of empty, like as mm -hmm. in traditional um, Chinese painting, like the kung, you know, the emptiness yeah. but that's implied. And but here, everything, it, it's more like everything is pushed more to the foreground, I think. Yeah, and, um, yeah. It's more intimate, you know. Yeah, it's very, very different. Um, yeah, it's a sort of... Um, uh, yeah, um, I, I like the sort of suggested space of works on paper, but here it's like this, the surface um, and the, 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 the texture and uh, that uh, these are things that the other one uh, does not have, you know? So, um, so I, I kind of really enjoy exploring those possibilities, you know. So would you say these are more, um, <clears throat> in quotes, westernized painting? Uh, I'm using a contemporary, uh, a, a more familiar language for the West. Um, like I said, my project is still the same of um, sort of mm -hmm. making visible of the labor of, or the lives of those who uh, from the countryside and their struggle and their like small triumphs. Um, but yeah, the, I'm using a language, maybe it's, you know, audience in America, Europe would feel more, um, you know, more familiar with, you know? Um, yeah, but, yeah, I mean, just on a twist of that, maybe not because, you know, there is this still a, a kind of, well, you're supposedly, you're, you know, you're, an artist trained in China, so therefore they have this, I think, a really retrograde look at what might be considered, you know, uh, what Chinese art looks like. We, I mean, we all know it goes through the whole range. I mean, there are yeah. plenty of your contemporaries who have always just used, um, con you know, con more contemporary modes of expression while mm -hmm. you have gone through, you know, a, a, you kind of have gone through a different route, right? So, I, um, I, I was, yeah, I try to, in a way, swim against the tide a little bit there. Yeah, well, it, it's like, you know, anything when you're being forced into a, a position that, I mean, we have individual preferences and, and requirements and, and responses. So it's all of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but what were you thinking uh, when you made this, this transition? Um, uh, it's just another angle, another approach uh, by shifting the material allows me to do a different kind of approach uh, to the project, you know. Um, so um, in, I, I enjoy the challenge and the, you know, uh, of that very much, you know. Um, I, I, the process, I, I start from sketches and I start, and then I started to work with color on my sketch and uh, so it's a kind of, a, it's actually went through a long transformation process, you know, mm. to arrive at this, so. And perhaps, could you talk a little bit about some of the steps on that transformation? Um, or? <laughs> well, you know, I think it's a, sometimes I kind of, I feel like when to stop, it was a big challenge because sometimes I, I put too much detail in there and I, I feel like it, I wanted to pull back, you know? So um, I wanted to be still calligraphic. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I was saying like, you need, I wanted to be um, not slick, but just to kind of, um, uh, you know, very much, let the audience in on the process, you know? Mm. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, um, th there are certain things I was looking for, you know? And sometimes I went overboard and uh, I had to walk back, you know? Some earlier stage I like better and, you know, so I was, it was kind of a trial and error and, right. you know, kind of, yeah. 
Well, I don't think you were ever slick. I mean, I think you were <laughs> <laughs> refined, maybe you could say very refined and very, <laughs> you know, like um, detailed and very uh, considered, right? Deliberate. And this, this feels a lot more, well, spontaneous. Yeah, yeah um, loose. It feels yeah. loose. Yeah, yeah. In a, in a way that kind of replicates the jumble of um, all the furnishings and things. I mean, a lot of these scenes are, are indoors taken outdoors, you know, or as if, well, some of these people probably don't have any place to be indoors. I, I'm not sure, you know, in terms of homelessness and, and yeah. just improvising living quarters and things like that, no? Yeah, yeah. So. I very much like to, um, like, get the viewer really in the middle of this, um, what's happening. That's why I wanted to to have certain kind of intimacy, you know. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's rather new, don't you? I mean, like they mm -hmm. they seem to be sort of real people. I mean, because in many of your other, um, well, just some of them, they the, the people or the, or the images portrayed were, uh, as someone mentioned earlier, you know, kind of uh, folkloric or they were ghosts or they were you know they were not real people but everyone here is is pretty real and mm -hmm. and they do feel like you know that that you're looking at a at more at individual at individuals mm -hmm. i mean there is that portrait do we have it here of that person that, that we discussed earlier uh, when you and i were talking uh, yeah. that the, the man from oh, here yeah yeah. Do you do these often? Because it's like a, it, it's a full, you know, it's a it's a focused portrait and it's nothing. A focused else. portrait. <laughs> yeah, uh, we were talking about that. Yeah, uh, when I first in the '90s, I was living in East Village, and I often goes to Chinatown to um, to to do grocery shopping things. I walk down and um, by the park there, and uh, there's a coffee shop. So I. You know, strike up conversation with the people there, and uh, and they were this guy was telling me, or you know, someone like him was telling me that they work very hard their whole life, and they wanted their children to do better, and finally their children were quite successful and bought a big house in New Jersey. They invited him to join them there, and he was there, and but after a while, he he doesn't want to live there anymore. He, he feels like he want to come back to Chinatown to be with people he struggle with, and in his little apartment, he feels like more comfortable. Uh, you know, so. Um, so. And, and yet, you didn't show him in in his apartment. I mean, well, and, and also, uh, this is a new work. It's from nineteen. It's from this year. So yeah, yeah. So you, is this from memory then? Yeah, my work is, I think it's really all, almost all of it. Mm -hmm. I don't do plein air painting. I don't do, you know, I do drawings. I, I go to places that I do a lot of drawings, but I never uh, like have a, a a canvas or a, I do like the you know, plein air painting is not part of my, my thing. I did that and when I was a student. So I did the, some training in, plain air painting, but I think my work is always like um, have to do with memory and has to do with a different, it come, arrived at a whole different process, you know. Um, yeah. You know, you had, um, I, I don't know if this is, you know, going back, but I was just thinking of what you had said earlier um, uh, about technocratic societies and, and how they define progress versus what, what you have witnessed or the, how people define progress and how yeah. they don't tend to acknowledge that. And yeah. in some of your works, is, is that what you are also addressing? The yeah, it's, um, yeah, no, this, you know, when I was using the metaphor of like wind or the, uh, uh, this, you know, there's, I feel like th there's something I was trying to criticize or trying to I have a big problem with is the leadership there um, has such a um, idea of progress, like how history should, like they feel like they have the answer to the history of where everybody should be. And so in the result is, you know, 
people in the rural area, they, they have very complex system of mutual help of living off the land. You know, for example, I did a scroll. Um, it's about the trees where a villager, their ancestor plant all these different trees to use as the insurance for their uh, descendant. So at a different time of the year when food becomes scarce, they, you can have the tree leaves or flower or bush, different bushes and things, you can help you to survive, you know? Um, and also some villages have way to take care of their people without children. These people getting old with no children. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden the, the, the village was asked to leave their home. Um, so they wanted to leave together. Uh, you know, so sometimes they cannot accommodate. Like during, do, when I'm doing my research, I, um, like the Three Gorges Dam, people were really scattered all over China. But over uh, the, the North South Canal project, which getting, uh, building the canal, getting the water from south of China, Yangtze River, all the way to Beijing, a thousand mile journey. Um, there, there was a lot of people displaced as well. And, uh, you know, there, um, at least in that um, kind of resettlement program, uh, people were able to kind of keep more or less together. Like the village would move to a whole another location. Um, so there, there are, these are, maybe I can see they're doing uh, better, you know, so, um, I mean, there were, there were protests as well, you know, organized protests, like in China, like the, um, I talked to some officials that they were, their phone is on 24 hours a day. If the major highway is blocked, they have to be showing up at the scene. And the farmers know that. And they were, because they were unhappy about the settlement, they went to block the highway. You know, so as a way to negotiate. So there were many such like a protest. We don't hear about it here, you know, but there were, you know, uh, many like local resistance to some of this top down policy, you know. And I, I always get very interested in this kind of pushback, you know. Yeah. So who, um, just to say, I mean, who were some of your influences? I mean, what other artists besides, you know, situation, oh, how, how, how was your, how, how was I you? love the Yuan painters. Um, I love uh, Chen Laolian, Chen, Chen Hongshou, Chen Laolian, um, Shi Tao, and um, uh, the Mad Monk. <laughs> sorry? The mad monk, the mad. Uh, the mad monk, yeah, yeah. B because in Chen Laolian's work, it, yeah. it's so, it's it's also like I said, it's a, like, he always tried to, you know, even his, he made a painting for his friend who is a uh, official and he's trying to say, why don't you give up your job and try to, uh, you know, uh, follow the path of uh, Tao Yuanming to, live in the country that be happy man, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> um, instead yeah. of being involved with this dirty backstabbing official job and uh, he did many other, and there's many other examples of artists, like there's artists I really like, he make these uh, plants, but you don't see any roots because that was like a very silent way to protest for him. Um, there is a painting of this horse. Uh, many times in the classical poetry, the horse representing is representing the the painter many times. And the the horse has you can only see bones and uh, uh, you know he is a starving horse. You know, uh, so there's a many way of um, kind of uh, express yourself without like lose your head you know so i mean like uh artists like uh, 
Du Fu. I I love uh, poetry. So like Du Fu is, um, you know, they were all climbing this tower and um, they, um, um, everyone was described the scene, but Du Fu has described this flock of bird who is um, flying towards the capital. And he described the birds, everyone was thinking about their own well-being. So it, as a way to satirize the sort of officials that are working for the country, you know. Um, I actually, the earlier painting, I have a group of fat birds, and um, I don't know if you guys can see that, but yeah, the, of the five paintings early on, um, they're called Higher Ups, um, the one before that. Oh, this one right here. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. one. Whoops, no, the other one. Uh, yeah, this one. So these fat birds, like, is completely influenced by Du Fu's poem, you know, of of these birds thinking about their own well well being, welfare, you know. Um, so, um, of course, I I I think um, I have this. Uh, you know, I love Goya, I love Bruegel, and I love. Uh, I mean, like. I love all kinds of paintings, you know. I love um, Matisse and, uh, you know. I I the windows, that looks very Matisse-y in, in, <laughs> in the recent work. Yeah, yeah, I love like Laid Brock. Uh, I saw a big show of his when I just came to New York. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, in terms of, I love painting of all kinds, you know, abstract painting and, you know, Howard Hoskin, and you know, like oh, for the color, oh my God, yeah, 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 his color. But, you, but your space too, and in, in some of these recent works, look very cubist, you know. Uh huh. Jacob With those tilting, you know, or different. Uh, Lawrence places, is different making areas. paintings about yeah. migrants, African American migrants. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. So. so um, you you have some still lifes in the um, yeah details in in the in the recent works. Maybe mm -hmm. we can go to them. It, do do they what do they signify something? I mean, not everything. Yeah, so like this more, one but... is my early pan pandemic. I I look back at the early pandemic, yeah. and so the title is early spring bloom. It, it was so horrifying what's happening, and yet when you go outside to take a walk. Uh, you see a beautiful blossom. I was like, wow, this is such a contrast with the horror that we feel and and the beauty of nature. You know, like it's almost I've never seen something so beautiful in terms of how that spring, how that spring blossom is so beautiful because we're all so miserable, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, for the, the title of the show is The Sunflower. Sunflower Turns Back. Turns and, Back. Yeah. And you have talked about the sunflower in its, I think, more normal position as, as being, you know, heliotropic, pointing toward the sun. But yeah. this one is turning back. Would you? Yeah. So um, you children, yeah. I think that today, too, I think there are songs written about sunflowers how we should, you know, children should be always turned like a sunflower and the party or the, you know, is like the sun or the, you know, Chairman Mao was the sun or now maybe Xi Jinping is the sun. We, we have to, you know, turn all day long facing the sun and get all the nutrition from the sun and all the way back, you know, the sun, actually the sunflower, um, is turning and waiting for the sun to rise, you know? So this, uh, that was all part of the propaganda I was growing up with. And um, uh, and so I want to depict sunflower that turn its back, you know, to the sun. Um, yeah. So this is coded and more subtle resistance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so so, my, yeah, it's um, my way of, um, uh, dealing with it. Uh, so, um, 
So how, how do you um, um, identify, you know, uh, as a Chinese artist, as a Chinese American artist, as a... I see it's a, that's an interesting question because I, like I have been here for half of my life yeah. and half of my life is in China. Um, I, you know, my, I was back in China for six years and that's was able to reconnect with some old friends and, you know, I was taking care of my father and, and made us some shows there. Um, so when I was back, I feel very Chinese, you know, uh, but when I'm here, you know, of course, right now, like I couldn't live in China. I, I feel like that atmosphere there, you know, this everyone has to confirm, conform, you know, to to the state of the party and have to, you know, express your loyalty. I, I just couldn't stomach that, you know. It's, it's very uh, distasteful for me. And even though, I think it's not easy to be Asian American in during the Trump years, especially when they just got back. You know, all this anti-Asian hate and all this, it was, but still I feel like I can say what I want and I can make my work. So, you know, I think these days um, the idea of identity is important, um, especially uh, yet, um, I feel like we, I feel like more like a global citizen in a way, like, like to, to, to think about where we have more pressing, uh, we have more pressing problems like yeah. the climate change. And we need to think bigger. We need to think about, you know, how to, to, you know, make make sus sustainable development and, and make the civil society stronger of everywhere you know I, I i feel i feel like our world is so multifaceted we're, we're simultaneously this are uh, fighting with so many different horrible things at the same time you know you have a moral police in iran you have people who are not allowed to marry, uh, to have sex or any kind of thing. Uh, it's illegal in Indonesia. Uh, you know, Russia is is horrible. And, you know, like, I, I feel like we, I, I have, I'm so focused on that, you know, anyway. Yeah, well. I don't know if I'm answering your question. But. <laughs> no, no, no. Of course, I mean, I, I think we all were hoping for a much more global society. After all, you know, as you said, the and that any and that you address in your work. I mean, there are huge, you know, social, political, environmental issues, yeah. and that yeah. these things should take precedence. But instead, we're you know, everyone's just um, fighting each other, and 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 more and more authoritarian regimes are, you know, it's yeah. taking over, I mean, which like, is unbelievable, you know, but. Unbelievable. Um, I mean, like Trump era, you know, I was unbelievable. Like here we have opportunity, like he's like, oh, it's, oh, the job is taken by the Chinese. And, and he was so, you know, but here there's opportunity for working class in America to build solidarity with the Chinese workers in China. Uh, to to feel like uh, we are the same human beings and we can, you know, try to make a difference and fighting capitalism, fight, fighting the power of, you know, the dictators and try to, you know, but it, to, somehow the leaders are trying to separate us. You know, you you really you really see that um, the dark forces, like nationalism is is going crazy in China and in America, it's like it's very strong as well. And all these things just make me feel like, ah, oh, this is, we're going in the wrong direction. You know, this is terrible. Yeah, and we have these huge, you know, again, these huge kind of migrations everywhere because I mean, many of it's forced, some of it is 
just trying to get somewhere else so they can so you have a modicum of freedom do you think that there's going to be a, a new uh, a new wave of contemporary chinese artists coming back to the united states or coming here for the first time in in the next few I years I, there are so many wonderful so talented artists in china i, I mean uh you know i hope they can you know maybe even in secret make the work they want to make and maybe showing is more difficult, I think, uh, in today's climate there. But um, still, um, yeah, I don't know. It's a, I, I, I want to see more than coming here, you know? Um, so then, no matter how you frame your, 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 your subjects, what you want is a, 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 a more universal, um, Response. I mean, what what you're treating is something that is of universal um, rec acknowledgement, recognition. Yeah. Even though your language is, I don't know, maybe it's your language is Chinese <laughs> in some ways, and in some ways it's a, a melange too, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, some kind of hybrid. I mean, who is not hybrid these days, right? It's um, um, um but most important thing is I feel like. Uh, uh, the love of painting is very important to me. And I wanted to find the right language. I mean, I, I tortured myself, try to find the right, you know, color and <laughs> the right, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's so important. And, and that is, is still very meaningful to me, you know. Uh, I think I, I made this group of work is basically try to keep my, my, uh, my head, you know, above the water, you know, with so many depressing things happening. Um, I want to focus my attention um, at the job at hand, you know, what I can do, <laughs> which is very limited. Um, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. Little, well, little sounds a little bit too pessimistic, maybe, but. Yeah, it's, I don't, know. I, I, really I don't think you are. Are you? I mean, whatever you you know. I uh, I think uh, there's that... a streak of me, but sometimes can't go down. You know. <laughs> yeah. Just to say here, I, I I think I've known you 20 years or so, and um, you know, I I I I I just think that the kind of humanitarian in, impulse the the, the empathy, um, the, the sympathy, you know, all of that it is not about pessimism. Yeah, we need more of that to overcome all this nationalism, you know, right. all this uh, hate, you know, <laughs> we've got plenty of that. So I think at this point, um, we are there questions um, for you, Yun Fei? Yes. Um... Yeah, thank you both so much for such an incredible conversation. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, the first one, my colleague uh, Chloe is going to ask on um, the behalf of an audience member. Wow, thank you so much for that incredible conversation. Um, we do have a question in the audience from Amanda. Um, do you work from memory to create these paintings of labor and quotidian life in China, or do you use photographs as well? Uh, I, I use some photographs and I use a lot of drawings. And the process is um, I do drawings, I do collages, and then I work with color. Um, sometimes color becomes a, some kind of important element um, and the light become ele important element, it gives some kind of buoyancy to the painting. So I feel like, oh, you know, it's, it has all these different aspects of life, uh, you know, like, you know, like the bicycle painting, I mean, the, the bike painting is like, this man is going home after, like I tell the story in my, my with myself that mm -hmm. he worked, he left his village and he come to the city and toiling for months and he's going home. And the, the title is called 
um, going home in high spirits. And I, in that painting, I was thinking about how like the color coming, all the light coming through the bushes is provides such a buoyancy to this man's, his small triumph, you know? He's, he brought, you know, think gift for his children and, and new clothes and things that he's gonna see them and he's going to, he's full of joy at the moment. And I wanted to see that's a, <laughs> Uh, I, I had that drawing for many, many months and uh, I didn't know how to proceed. But then I had this idea with the color and that helps me to get that painting. All of a sudden I want to see that painting on canvas and see, I was very motivated, you know, to make the work. Thank you so much for that answer. And thanks for that amazing question, Amanda. Thank you, Thank you Amanda. Thank you. Um, next, I'm going to go to my colleague Eleanor to ask on behalf of an audience member. Thanks for this super generous conversation. Your work is so beautiful, Yanfei. So really, really happy to have been able to get this insight today. Um, I'll be asking a question on behalf of Elizabeth. Elizabeth asks, curious how you navigated the acrylic on canvas versus the ink on mulberry in terms of viscosity. Touch is very much like ink painting and the paint is limpid drawn and when patterned, reminiscent of Vuillard. Curious if you'll stay with acrylic. Oh, um, I think I wanted to, depends on the subject, um, I wanted to, to do both in the future. But um, yeah, I feel in this painting, I'm more, you know, developed this uh, one direction, but the, um, the ink painting is, I, I still very much wanted to make that as well. Yeah, thanks um, for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I'm gonna go to GE to ask. Hi, thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you, Yofei. Question is, it seems as though through your figures, your figures seem to be asking us to contemplate the complex and often kind of surreal reality mm. of the displaced world that looks uncannily familiar. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, I, I see so much of, of what I see around me in your work as well. Um, is there anything to this? Um, so um, you you find them um, like relatable? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Like, For example, it seems as though in the one painting, there's numerous there's numerous household things out in, outside. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, as though if they've been displaced from their homes. And I see so much of that kind of thing in what we have to oftentimes hear of foreclosures where people are thrown out of their houses mm. on short notice. Yeah. Everything is out on the lawn and it's sort, of, it's sort of like you're living this new reality of outside in a very surrealistic way. And mm. it just seems so very universal. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, actually, um, uh, part of the reason I wanted to make it on canvas this time has to do with that, uh, you know, some, yeah, I have a friend said, is this happening in Brooklyn? You know, so yeah, it's a little bit like what you're saying, there's a feeling of connectedness and which I very much want, you know? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm so happy to get your comment. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, the this place, placement seems universal, like you were talking about before mm -hmm. of the, the things all over the world now competing yeah. against us. So yes. Yeah, very much. I mean, I yeah, yeah. I you know, when I was talking to people from elsewhere, like, you know, this sort of uh, uh yeah, the experience of you know displacement and things, yeah, they they people relate to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you um, so much, Yi. There uh, was a question in the chat um, about the size of the work. Um, I guess if you 
wanted to speak to the smaller size or the scale um, and kind of what, what that might mean to you um, for the content of the work? Yeah, um, the work generally are fairly um, small. So, um, and uh, at this time, I, I really like, it's sort of hanging a little bit low than usual and um, um, give you a sense of like, you know, I, I, part of my work in the past, I've done 60 foot long scrolls and I did that and at um, in New Orleans and I wanted to put in like 50 years of history of development of village and I wrote six stories and, you know, it was kind of very like, you know, I wanted to put condensed time in that way, but these are more, Kind of an intimate, um, smaller painting, and and I I wanted it to be like that, you know. Thank you. Um, and our final question uh, is from our very own Fang Bui. Um, I'm he's in a meeting, so I'm going to ask on his behalf, and he sends his huge congratulations to Breakthrough Show. He said. Um, so his question is: Is there a subtle or not so subtle depiction of? the grotesque in your work and may or may that not reference um, Philip Guston's late figurative paintings. Mm. Now, Philip Guston was a very important figure for me. I, um, when I um, discovered his work when I was still in Arkansas and the, uh, I even wrote an essay about his work because I feel like it's so, so wonderful. And uh, yeah, I, is a, is, I do like his work a lot. And at that time, especially, it was really, uh, I got blown away by it, you know? Yeah, but the idea of grotesque, of course, it's, um, um, I also like Goya and, uh, you know, um, Bosch and all these artists that uh, are very much, you know, interested in it, words, even though they're coming from Christian background and. I'm more from the sort of ghost story <laughs> tradition, you know. But you know, we, you know, we have like a Buddhist tradition of the hell, you know. And I, I also very much liking. Um, uh, I, and I was, I was fed with so many ghost stories when I was a kid. Grew up with my grandmother, so <laughs> and uh, yeah. So all that is like kind of funneling into my work, you know. Um, Great, thank you so much, Yanfei. Um, thank you both for this, this conversation. Uh, it is our tradition here at The Rail to end our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm so honored to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Ruja Mohasesi here to the stage. Ruja Mohasesi is an Iranian-born poet and educator. She is a 2022 McDowell Fellow and a graduate of the Pacific University MFA program. Her debut collection, When Your Sky Runs Into Mine, was a winner of the 22nd Annual Elixir Poetry Award and is available for pre-order now. We'll have a link to that in the chat. Her poems and reviews have appeared or are forthcoming in Narrative Magazine, Poet Lore, Rhino Poetry, and several other uh, publications. And thank you so much for being here, Ruja. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Carol, and thank you for the invite. And thank you for that wonderful conversation. Very inspiring. So nice to be introduced to your work this way, Yunfei. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wish I was in New York and could go and could go to the show, but uh, it's wonderful to have this chance. I love the, um, the, the subtlety with which you include politics in your work. Mm. Very inspiring. Inspiring to poets because as a poet, that's, what I aim for is the ambiguity and the subtlety mm. uh, which um, Chinese poets and Chinese artists have very strongly, also Middle Easterns, mm. to be able to uh, um, have that metaphors mm. and the, the subtlety of, of what is actually uh, intended. I'm still working on that. But today I'm going to um, share two poems. 
close the show with two poems. Um, the first one, and thank you, Yunfei, for mentioning the situation in Iran. I appreciate that. Um, this poem is in response to the ongoing situation right now in Iran. Um, the protest, the women-led protest is in its 80th day. And um, um, the, uh, right now, you probably all know that the uh, regime has begun to um, um, execute protesters and um, the visibility that they get is really, I think, what is the only thing standing in the way of the regime just going full fledged with the crackdown. And, uh, and so I encourage everyone to, if, if you are on social media or if you have you know, any ways to sort of share and amplify the voices of, of the protests, uh, of the protesters right now. So it's a difficult time for, for Iranians. And um, uh, I wrote this poem sort of early on when the protests first started in, in September and um, I'm still working on it. It takes a long time to write a poem. So it's not, it's not all there. It's called Zan Zendegi Azadi, which translates into woman life freedom is the name of the movement. Zan Zendegi Azadi. Zan Zendegi Azadi is the ends of our daughter's hair and imported tubs of dye by our bathroom sinks, promising Western overtones in violet and blue. It's our interrupted narrative where sunbeams still remember the ritual of reaching through a window to catch the careless toss of a handful of hair out of a face. Its highlights, growing out in tension and mistrust at the same ordinary pace as elsewhere. Its our roots pounded with suras and solemnity, pinned and pressed to grow yet lie in place under the imam's benediction, our shelter from the imperial's threat. When really all our daughters need is a little diversion, same as elsewhere, volume, the cheerfulness of henna, the stripping bleach of an influencer to be seen on TikTok, Botox, notwithstanding the dark, and tweets, and the chirping discontent and filtered static. Tonight, we feed our men lavash, panir sabzi. Daughters refuse supper and walk away, turning their backs on the goldfish that swim for their reflections crossing the dusk of courtyards, where heavy-hearted the pomegranates crack and wash the autumn light in ablution. Tonight, at every street corner, purchase, purchase a wide-angle gaze, boring into flesh. 0.68 caliber paint, plastic pellets, ammunition cudgels are made halal tonight. Heaven ordained to arrive from Shah Garb, the four directions made halal tonight. In this twilight, before and after the Magra prayer, beatings will be halal tonight. Surveillance cameras roll and note the degree of coverage. The wantonness of our girls whirling in Western ways, flames devouring headscarves, the imported purple, neon, crazed ends of millennial hair gawking in lipstick pink. Tonight, Zan Zendegi Azadi is the mobile phones held high by a chain of suns, corralled to document the buried midriff on the pavement, the panic. Two petite dunes of pre-adolescence pinched at the tips and braless and blood flowing unrestrainable into a pattern before she had a chance to bleed and be kissed on one cheek then the other by us mothers, her aunts, great aunts, before Maud Arjan had a chance to brush her clean washed bangs out of her eyes, kiss her forehead and compliment her for coming of age. And I'm going to read one more poem. Um, which is the closing poem of my forthcoming collection, um, which is called When Your Sky Runs Into Mine. That's available right now in pre -order, for pre-order and it will be out in February. And it's a poem that was inspired by a poem um, of Lucille Clifton's um, called, I think it's called To My Blue Coat, uh, To My Yellow Coat. It's an ode 
and um, it's dedicated to my great grandmother, Khanumjum, my only bangle for Khanumjum after Lucille Clifton. Today, I celebrate my only bangle, my one hand applause, the gold leaf on my family tree, my hand hammered heritage, my blood. Today, it refused to slide off, a rounded portal barring my hand in spite of the sweet talking soap, the slip of cold cream, in spite of not matching my low cut cocktail dress, my silver choker. It cleaved to knuckle and bone, held me by the wrist, each unalloyed carat ablaze. Here, it whispered, drop some coal under your eyes before you step out. Then let me hear you pronounce your name. Thank you all. Wow, thank you so, so much, Ruja. It's um, really incredible. Definitely everyone check out the link to Ruja's book. Um, thank you, of course, Yenfei and Lily for such a riveting conversation today. We'd like to thank everyone from James Cohen Gallery for um, helping with images and this event today. We would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible. You can view today's event in our full archive on the Rails YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events, like here in our daily NSC. This holiday season helped us sustain our work and reach our goal of raising $150,000 this month towards the Rails um, operations. You can su your support will keep our issues and events free. You can donate via a link in the chat. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a poetry reading with Ron Padgett on the event of his recent book, Dot. And you can now turn on your microphone and say hello and goodbye as you weep. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Faye and Lily, it was so great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Zhang <laughs> Fei. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and go see the show if you can. And go see the shows. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Thank you, reading for the reading also. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>